Hello friends! This video is basically a wrap up for the accessories and little bits that I've had to work on for Cowboy Peach that didn't fit into any of my other bigger videos. The two most important parts of the ensemble that I haven't gotten to yet are the overskirt and the hat. For these, I tried to take notes from history and from historical forms, but I did have to adapt them to better suit the illustration. To begin, the hat was based off of some illustrations I found of straw hats from the 1850s and 60s. At first, I was dubious if anyone even wore this kind of wide-brimmed style hat during the period, but it seems it was especially popular for outdoor sporting events to keep off the sun. These hats are made with a more traditional three-part construction than the modern domed crown we more often associate with sun hats today. I initially played with the idea of using a straw base for this hat, but decided against it as the bright white color might look a little odd or out of place on a straw hat, and at least from a historical perspective, they didn't tend to bleach straw or have an alternative to that that would be white. My construction methods for this hat are more or less exactly the same as almost all of the other hats I've made, so feel free to use this as a baseline for figuring out your own preferred construction for hat making. To pattern out the base of this hat, I started by taking the circumference of a large straw sun hat that was around the size I thought would look good for this, and then made the head opening using a rudimentary compass held to the radius of the inner opening's preferred dimensions. This is basically just half of the width of the opening. I tested that against my wig to make sure it wouldn't crush the sides. This wig is pretty heavily styled, so it's important to not have the accessories conflict with that. To adjust the shape, I applied the original cutout back to the shape it had been cut from. I found that for this hat, an elliptical shape worked better than a full circle, so I added a little bit back into the opening, but this will vary depending on how you want the hat to sit on your head and the circumference of your head. Maybe consider putting marks on the cutout to be able to realign it for fittings. Once I had a good shape set, I cut the pieces out of a stiff buckram. Personally, for big hats like this, I prefer what is sometimes called theater weight or heavy weight, which is super stiff and thick. This isn't a good material for, say, a little pillbox hat, but these super big wide brim hats need a lot of support. I just cut the crap out of my foot with my other foot. Trust no one, not even yourself. I mark out the inner opening and add a small seam allowance to be folded up into the crown for attachment later. I ended up cutting about four of these brim pieces because the buckram I ordered wasn't heavy duty enough on its own. The sizing used in buckram can be activated with water, so I lightly steamed them together. It's June 12th, it's a Tuesday, and as of last night, I got invited to come up to Atlanta and do a photo shoot safely with a photographer and another friend of mine. So I'm going to try and power through the last parts of my cowboy peach outfit. It's so close to being done, I just need to do a couple extra things. I need to finish the hat, I need to finish the overskirt, and I need to make a couple of accessories, and that's it. I'm done. So I think I'm going to try and get it done by uh, Friday is when I leave. So I've got today, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday before I leave. That's uh, three and a half days uh, to finish everything. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. If I can't, I'll wear something else. But fingers crossed, I think I can get it done in time. So we are going to start working fast. We're going to start working real messy and the lighting's going to be bad. But I'm going to see if I can power through the last of these accessories and uh, touch-ups before it's time. I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> a millinery gauge wire is sewn around the edge of the brim, as well as to the crown, inner opening, and top of the side bands. I recommend you do all of this before assembling, so you don't get stuck doing awkward hand sewing like I did. 
You can attach the wire carefully with a large zigzag stitch, catching the edge of the buckram and going over the wire completely. Be very careful if you are using a machine during this part as the needle could easily snap and fly off if you accidentally sew down on the wire directly. The ends are folded back on themselves to prevent any sharp edges and then lapped over each other. You want to overlap the edges to prevent a weak spot on the edge of the brim. The inside is clipped along the seam allowance to allow it to be turned inward, then the same steps are more or less repeated for the band and the crown. Once all the pieces of buckram are prepared, they need to be covered in fabric. This is very simply done by tracing the pieces of buckram onto your fabric of choice with a pretty big seam allowance. Here, I'm using a poly shantung. The exact amount of seam allowance isn't super important. For the crown, the edges are turned under to create a smooth and clean shape on top. This takes a decent amount of work, so go slowly and don't be afraid to start over if you need to. The back has to be cut to allow the pieces to lay flat on top of each other. I'm not sure how this would have been attached historically, but this is a good time to bust out the hot glue gun if you have one. I used mine to hold down the pieces as I smoothed them out. Since this is pretty messy and fray prone, I opted to line it with some cotton. The shape is traced out the same, but instead of turning under and trimming, I'm using a similar technique to making a patch pocket. The shape has a gathering stitch run through it around the edge, and then is placed over the original pattern shape and ironed in to form around that piece of the pattern. This piece is then layered on the bottom of the buckram crown and glued into place carefully. After this, I realized I hadn't put any wire into the band of the hat, causing it to lay a little wobbly. Since I'd already applied the fabric to this piece and top stitched it down, I opted to sew in the wire by hand, but you can avoid this by putting all your wire on in the beginning before you apply the fabric. Fabric for the band was plainly cut out, turned over to the inside, and top stitched down before being whip stitched to the hat base. I unfortunately did not get a lot of footage of the brim and the band of the hat being assembled as I was on a time crunch. I'm really sorry about that, but I will explain more about the assembly in a few moments. To cover the raw edges on the inside, I added a lining to this part as well. This should also have been done before sewing to the brim of the hat, but clearly I am a bit out of order. This lining was made from the same fabric as the exterior of the hat. I folded the edge over the bottom and glued it into place before whipping the edges of the lining to the fabric at the base of the brim. I then trimmed the lining to the height of the band and folded over the top. 
I messed up here and trimmed the fabric too close to the lip of the band, meaning I didn't leave myself ample room to fold over the top edge and ended up having to fudge the edge a bit, but luckily the fabric was long enough that the lining was still able to cover it. I'm taking care here to make sure that the stitches are not visible from the outside of the hat and any stitching I'm doing is only seen on the inside. Once it was all lined and ready to go, I attached the crown piece to the band using whip stitches. These pieces just butt up against each other, so I try to use small but strong stitches to make sure they hold together. To finish up the hat, I added a small comb to the front as well as two loops of yellow ribbon at the sides to pin through. Traditionally, a hat pin would have been used to secure the whole thing, but I find this to be more secure since the hat is resting on quite a small section of my head and is also being worn over a wig. The comb and ribbons were done in yellow to better blend in with the wig color. So I realized that I didn't explain a lot of the assembly of this, so I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on the way the fabric goes onto this hat. So it's made of three parts, the brim, I forget what this part is called, and then the crown. This is not a very professional um, explanation as you can probably guess. So basically the way it goes is you cut out two pieces of fabric for the brim, one piece of fabric for this part and then one piece for the crown and you saw how I assembled this more or less in the video already. So the way this part works is, is that you cut out two pieces of fabric that are the same size as the brim and you sew them on top and bottom around the edges and you don't leave any sort of overhang. There's a couple different ways to do it but this is just my personal preference because it's easy and it hides things and you don't have to do a lot of extra work. So you have the wire around the edge and you have the fabric around the edge and it's raw. So what you do is you take a bias tape either in a matching fabric or something that kind of looks similar, or you could do a contrast if you want to, and you stitch that around. I usually do the top by machine and then the bottom by hand, but you can do it in reverse. Honestly, for this one, I probably should have done it opposite because the hat's gonna be facing up like this for the most part, but it works either way. So you do all of that and then you cut out around the center part for the head, stick the round part of the hat around that, stitch the two together and then insert the crown. So basically all of it's just butted up against itself. It's not done the way garments are where you have two sides that are sewn right sides together and then folded out to have a clean seam. Most of that is either covered by hat bands or by small hand sewing or that kind of thing. Then the hat band was just uh, really basic. It's just a strip of fabric. I measured around the outside circumference of the hat, cut that out as two rectangles, sewed them together, stitched that down in the back here. And then the bow is a pretty basic bow pattern. Um, very simply came together. This is the kind of bow that I usually design for this kind of thing. It's a little floppy, uh, a little bit floppier than I meant for it to be. I probably should have interfaced it more than I did. Honestly, I could have even used some of the buckram that I used for the hat and done that in one layer and had like a very nice stiff bow, but I don't mind the way it looks drooping down. I think it's kind of fun, uh, so I'm not pressed about it. If I decide I want to change it at some point, this is very easy to remove and do again. But that's the basics of the hat. Um, it's a really strong mix of hand sewing 
and uh, machine sewing, but it comes together pretty quickly and you can hide a lot of sins uh, if you goof or mess up on anything really easily and not have to worry about it, which is why I like it. Now that the hat is finished, it's time to move on to the overskirt. This shape is kind of funny and seems to pop up in a lot of modern princess illustrations and media, most likely because of pop culture icons like Cinderella, but I truly don't know where it came from. Historically, I can't seem to find a direct correlation between any styles and these odd puffs that come up. That being said, I decided to base this specific overskirt off Swiss waist designs that were contemporary to the rest of the dress from the period of the 1850s and 60s. Swiss waists were somewhere between a decorative corset and a belt and could be made in many different shapes and sizes and with or without skirts. Some were only belts while others could have straps that went over the shoulders, creating more of like a, a fitted bodice. For mine, I did a pointed shaped belt, which the overskirt was then attached to. I do want to add a disclaimer that absolutely nothing I did in the construction process of this belt slash skirt is historically backed. I went into this with the cosplayer mindset of do something and hope it works. To make the pattern for the belt, I used the cellophane and tape method that a lot of cosplayers use. I won't go into depth about it here, but I will link some stuff in the description down below if you want to know more about that. Since the bodice is pointed at the front, I wanted to be sure that whatever shape the belt turned out as would fully cover the bodice underneath, which is why using the cellophane and tape method was so useful as I could get an exact uh, outline of where everything would be. Once I had my pattern good to go, I started by tracing that shape out of fashion and strength fabric layers. After this, I sewed the cotton layers together before I flatlined the cotton to one side of the taffeta. So I have gotten the belt like halfway through. I have made an interlining with two layers of cotton fabric so I could put some boning just in the middle and at the edges here to keep it from collapsing on itself. I want to make sure that it stays pretty sturdy. And then I have sewn those interlining layers to one half of the belt and I am going to go ahead and sew the two halves together now and hopefully this works. To finish the edges of the soon to be made over skirt and as decoration for the belt, I made some bias tape. So a couple things have happened since my last update. Um, I finished the belt and I ended up adding a little strip of bias tape to the top just because it felt so bland and textureless. Uh, I was thinking about doing like lace or something, but I felt like that was going to depart way too much from the original source material. So I just did a little bias tape and I hope that it looks okay. Um, after that, I cut out the skirt uh, and... <laughs> I ended up ironing the two parts in the wrong direction, so the hem faces this way, but the fold over faces the other way, so I am just going to hope for the best with hiding this little fuzzy hem up here under the belt. Uh, other than that, I was trying to decide whether I was going to do like a, a fixed gather and just have it open in the back or what I was going to do about that. But what I'm thinking I'm going to do, and this is an absolutely harebrained scheme, is I folded this over to make a casing, and I'm actually, I think, going to put a string through this so I can just draw it tight every time I wear it. That way I don't have to struggle to get in and out of it, and I don't have to cut a slit open in it and worry about that fraying and having to finish that edge. Um, I am going to put some little uh, attachments on it as well so I can hook it into the belt and make sure it doesn't fall down and you know reveal this but 
I think that's what I'm going for. There is absolutely no historical evidence for this, but it's what I gotta do with this wacky dude uh, little garment. To finish off the overskirt, I sewed an edging of bias tape around it with machine stitches on one side and hand finishing on the other for the most seamless look. I hate trying to do a fold over hem on circular shapes. I will almost always opt for a facing or a bias tape when given the chance, like here. So, in the course of putting this garment on and off multiple times now, I have managed to accidentally pull loose one of the pull tabs that I had put into it. So I am going to replace that with some ribbon that hopefully won't shred. Uh, and enforce that a little bit, but if you do this at home or something similar to this, I don't recommend using this kind of silky cord. It looks like it can fray and pull away from the edge if you don't secure it very well. So don't do that. Use ribbon or cord or something a little bit more secure, um, and you won't have to redo it like I'm about to have to. So it's hard to see since I'm, you know, basically in a nightgown, but I have done the little funny bib thing for the front of the skirt, and I just need to get that top hem uh, finished. It's pleated with one box, pleated in the front, and then just regular night fleets going out the sides, and I kind of just eyeballed this. So basically, the way this works is it goes over the hem, around the body and then hooks in the back. The dress form is slightly larger than I am so we can't really get it hooked all the way but we'll get it you know, part of the way and that'll be good enough. And in the front the point more or less covers what's underneath. Again it fits me better than the dress form, but how it works is, is there's two little drawstrings are in the back here. You basically just pull them up and gather it down and just kind of place the gathers where you want them to be. And it gives you a lot of flexibility with your shape. It also means that I didn't have to pattern anything too complicated. And once they are tied up, just pop a bow on those boys, flip them to the inside, and then tuck it under the belt. And I do have hooks on the underside for more security if I feel like I need them, but usually the belt is so snug against my body that it kind of just holds them in place and I don't have to worry about it. Now we have this. And generally I like to pull some more of the gathers to the front to make them a little bit more present. Um, the back can kind of just arch over it, but you want, you want that presence in the front, so. Ta-da! Putting on the skirts here wasn't just for show. The next step is to fit in the little bib thing to the belt and overskirt to make sure it's sitting right. I did this by simply sticking it up to where I thought it looked right and then pinning it into place, being careful to only pin through the belt and not the bodice. The illustration also calls for a couple of bows, so I pinned those on as well to make sure that they were in position.
The bib and bows were sewn on by hand. I turned the pinked edge of the top of the bib under while stitching to help prevent rubbing which could hasten the unraveling of the edge as I went. And that's pretty much it. The earrings and brooch were already around from previous cosplays, but let me know if you'd like a little tutorial on how I made those. I've done multiples at this point because I use them so often. Um, the gloves are vintage uh, with an added lace trim from another cosplay as well. Uh, and no one can see them, but I do in fact have white cowboy boots on under the dress uh, in pretty much all the photos and times I've worn it. So. Thanks for watching. Um, the reveal is coming up next. I've been sitting on some video footage of it for a while. I'm sorry this has taken so long to get around to. Um, grad school has been kicking my butt, uh, so I essentially went catatonic for a couple months because of that and then needed some downtime and I've been working on my thesis over the summer too. So uh, patience is absolutely appreciated, but let me know what you'd like to see from me in the future. I've got a couple video ideas, but if you want to see any more makeup tutorials or constructions uh, for costumes or anything like that, let me know. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!